Hey listeners, it's your host, Daisha. So music is activism. That's not something that we have talked about ever in classical music terms. I kind of know what that means in rock music terms. You know, I think about Bob Dylan. I think about folk singers. I think about all of the different music festivals that we have that support different causes and things like that in the rock music world. But in the classical music world, like, what does that mean exactly? Well, we are about to explore what that means in a two-part series that we're doing. The episode that you're going to hear today is my conversation with cellist Amanda Gukin. And uh, she's doing this thing called the Forward Music Project, wherein she has commissioned a bunch of female composers to write pieces of music about the lives of women and girls. And she's doing a whole lot more, but you'll hear about that in the episode uh, the next part of the series, which will be coming out in a couple of weeks, is with uh, composer Craig Hella Johnson, and that takes the conversation in a totally different direction. I think you're really going to dig both of these episodes, and it's a it's a pretty different take on the music than um, we've ever done on the show before. So anyway, right after you subscribe to, rate us and review us on iTunes, sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. I'm Daisha Clay, host of The Classical Classroom, a show where experts teach me about classical music. I used to know very little about classical music, and now I'd like to think that I know slightly more than very little. What I have learned is that classical music isn't the obscure, static art form that I thought that it was. In fact, it's a dynamic force that's doing amazing things in the world right now. Welcome to a Classical Classroom sub-series, Music Works. We'll go behind the scenes at concerts, hear amazing artist stories, and look at all the ways that classical music is working in the world today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Classical Classroom. I'm Deisha Clay, and here with me today is Amanda Gukin. She is a cellist. She took a really non-traditional path in her career to becoming a cellist, which we're going to talk about soon. Um, She's a member of the award-winning Public Quartet, She developed the quartet's Emerging Composers program, Public Access. Today, she's going to talk about her latest project, the Forward Music Project, and about music as activism. Amanda, welcome to the Classical Classroom. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. So, okay, so before we talk about the Forward Music Project, I think it's important for people to know who you are to get a feel for why why you would do a project like this. So how did you become a cellist. What what was your path to be becoming a musician and to eventually becoming an activist who uses music? I started playing cello in public school uh, when I was in elementary school. Only string instruments were offered to the students. And I really wanted to play like the clarinet or the flute or something, you know, appropriate instruments for little girls to start on. <laughs> right. So I just chose the cello kind of randomly because I didn't want to hold my arm up (laughs) and (laughs) the bass was too big. And I was like, oh, the cello looks cool. I get to sit down with it. And I actually was explaining the story to to somebody else the other day. And I went back to the first memory that I actually had the cello in my hands. And my stepfather had dropped off this little black case in the entryway of our house. And I came home from school and I was just sitting there and I was like, yes, and tore open the case and just started, I don't know, just, you know, messing around with Uh the bow and the strings. And um, I think I had a real immediate response to just having an instrument in my hand. Awesome. And I ended up going to school at the Manus College of Music Mm -hmm. and... My whole young life, I was just one track mind. I was going to be a cellist, and that was it. I didn't really know what I was going to do with the cello. It was presented to me in the conservatory setting that I had a few choices. I could become an orchestra musician. I could become a chamber musician. I could become a soloist. I could become a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I kind of felt like none of those options really fit at the time, but I was completely unaware to all of the other outside-of-the-box opportunities that there were. And I was a little frustrated when I graduated because I didn't feel like I had quite found myself, found my voice. And I jumped ship and moved to Barcelona, 
Spain for two years. And for the first year that I was there, I, I really didn't touch the cello at all. Oh, okay. uh, I needed. I felt like I needed to reassess. I put it away for a little while, and I, to to earn a living, I um, created an after school program where I taught students between the ages of like three and 13 mm-hmm. English. And I developed my own program after school and we sang songs and we worked from books mm-hmm. and we would put on like theater productions for the parents where they would write their own scripts in English and sing songs in English. And so it was really fun to be create still creative in terms of how I taught these kids and still being artistic and tapping into a different side of me that wasn't just solely in music. Right. So you kind of got away from the thing that you had been steeped in your whole life and kind of discovered who you were outside of that. Right, right. So so what happens after after Barcelona? So after Barcelona, well, I did start to play again when I was living there, and I met other musicians, and mm-hmm. I started to do gigs and play in orchestras, and I had a a duo partner, and I found a really great teacher. So for the rest of my stay, I was performing and playing a lot. And then I had this feeling that uh, I really wanted to go back to school, and I wanted to go to graduate school. So I came back to the States with every intention to uh, take additions for grad school again. Mm -hmm. And then I was... The first job that I took when I got back to the States was I worked in sales in a very upscale dog boutique. <laughs> and this dog boutique was actually called Doggy Style. And I think it was... <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, and something just inside of me just I really piqued my interest that I wanted, I maybe... I wanted to work in animal science and wanted to work as a veterinarian. Uh-huh. And this is something that I had actually, if I had not found the cello, I probably would have been doing that because when I was a kid, I was just obsessed with animals. And that was something that I thought that I wanted to do until I really started to get into music. So this might have been just something that was dormant for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And I actually landed a position as a veterinary technician. And I was very lucky in that my boss was also a musician and he played jazz trumpet. And so he said that part of the reason why he wanted to hire me was because he trusted musicians (laughs) and that we are accountable and, you know, able to cooperate and work together and think on our feet and think creatively. And we have good rapport with people. And so it was great. You know, we talked a lot about music on our off time. And the first day on the job, I was assisting, not really assisting, more just observing a feline spay. And so I'm there I am, you know, this cellist stepping in like the first day into an entirely new career. And I'm witnessing fallopian tubes being ah, like, oh pulled God. out of a cat's abdomen. And I'm just, I was really like I was not grossed out I was incredibly fascinated and I just felt like there is so much out there that I just don't know (laughs) and I just wanted to continue on this path and I wanted to be able to make everything that I wanted to do in my life work Mm. Yeah, <laughs> And so I was working full-time as a veterinary technician, and at that same time, I was freelancing. I was writing music for uh, theater and film, and I had started public quartet. Mm-hmm. And so I had all of these things that were, you know, kind of up in the air that I was juggling. And a job like that, you really have to put in 100%. And when you are a professional musician, you have to put in 100%. And there's no way in 24 hours a day I was able to put in 200%. So eventually I had to make the decision and it was the right decision to not pursue the career in in animal science. And so I, I left and I found another job in music. So I was, um, co-managing a musician's union, a folk musician's union, actually. Oh, wow. That was super awesome. I learned a ton about union leading and about finances and budget and um, pension plans and health care plans. And I got to talk to 
a lot of really wonderful people. Pete Seeger actually started this this oh, union, wow. so you can just imagine all of the amazing folk musicians across the United States that were members. That's crazy. So I guess I always had one hand in administration and jobs that really required a different facet and then one hand in my playing. Mm -hmm. And it was hard because for musicians when you're when you're performing musician there's it's not like this as much anymore but at the time there was a lot of this sort of undercurrent of if you are not dedicating your life 100% then it must mean that you're not capable. <sighs> <laughs> or if you have a day job, then yeah. you're not actually able to have a full-time career in music and you should feel very ashamed of that. Or if you have any interests outside of music that, you know, oh, those might be interesting, but they better be a hobby. Otherwise, it's going to really invade in, in your career. Yeah. And so part of me felt like a little ashamed to tell people that I had a day job when I would go on gigs because I didn't want to give off the impression that I wasn't serious about my playing career or that I wasn't capable of handling all of the hours of practice and everything that goes into a performance career. Mm -hmm. And it's just was a little unusual to have somebody, you know, come from wearing scrubs and sneakers and then going into playing a gig. So, right. but now I'm really proud of that and it has fed into so much of what makes my career today. And a lot of that has helped me formulate the quartet and get things off the ground in terms of administration roles. You know, mm -hmm. I I had to write newsletters and I had to create budgets and write grants and, you know, network and do all of these things that I think all of the different kinds of careers that I had had just enriched everything as right. opposed to take away. So how do we get from this point in your life to what you're doing now uh, like mm -hmm. with the Forward Music Project? What, why you told me a little when we talked before about this sort of unease that you began to feel about the these things that you were passionate about kind of not showing up in, in your music life. Yes. Um... So I, well, I had said that I came back to New York City in 2007 to pursue a master's degree, and uh, that never actually happened uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> because I was exploring all of these other pathways, and then the quartet started to take off. I felt like, ooh, maybe it's not so necessary that I get another degree. Mm. And then when I turned 30, I felt like, I really needed to, um, I just was dealing with a lot of low self-confidence in terms of my own playing and f a feeling of staticness that I, I was losing, um, my creative juices were just kind of leaking out of my brain. <laughs> so I decided to go back to grad school and I found a really wonderful teacher, Julia Lichten, mm -hmm. and I ended up studying with her at Purchase College, um, and I had these long drives from Brooklyn to Purchase, and I often would listen to public radio. And that's a that's a terrible influence. <laughs> I know um. <laughs> public radio is the worst. It's just the worst. <laughs> nobody, nobody supports public radio. It gets you thinking just, about stuff. It's yeah. It's like it's insidious. Oh, it's man. awful. It's really <laughs> awful. It's awful. I mean, I was like, "What are you doing? Putting all these thoughts into my brain? I don't want to make me care about things." Yeah. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I just turned on, and it was in the middle of this very amazing speech by this woman out of Seattle. She's a politician. She's actually a leader of a socialist party out there. <laughs> and I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but her name is uh, Kshama Sawant. Mm -hmm. And she is doing amazing work literally for the people in the best sense of the term. <laughs> and what really struck me actually was the power and passion and conviction I was hearing come from this woman's voice. Mm -hmm. And so often when you hear politicians speaking, activists speaking, 
you don't hear a woman's voice on the platform yeah. often enough. And they are out there. It's not that they aren't speaking out. It's just that they are not being featured enough. Right. It's just the the platform for women to speak up and speak out just always seems to be pulled out from under us. So I really felt like my musical career was just drifting away from actually being in touch on a very humanistic level. And of course, I believe that art is healing. I believe in art for art's sake. And there are many ways to use your art to help society, to help yourself, to bring joy to people, to create empathy. But I did not feel like my feet were actually on the ground really doing anything. Mm -hmm. And this was also coming off a couple years of being away from a really important job in my life, which I hadn't mentioned yet, which was I volunteered and worked on a crisis hotline. Oh, wow. I did that for five years, and it was one of the most influential opportunities in my life. Mm. The main thing that I took away is that you never know what someone is going through. And it had been a couple years since I had left that organization, and when I was with them, I really felt like I was a true activist for uh, crisis prevention, suicide prevention, and everything that goes into that, you know, mm -hmm. um, LGBTQ rights and race and finances and trauma and sexual assault, uh, it's all wrapped up in trauma and crisis. And... Um, and it's an exercise every day. And even just being away from that environment, I feel like my skills are diminishing because to actively listen and truly listen without judgment is mm. a real exercise of the brain. Mm. It is, it's very exhausting in a way because you are actually working. You are very involved in the listening process mm -hmm. and in the response process of being extremely aware of what you're saying and how you're communicating. Mm. So I was like, I've got to do, I have to do something again. And the only platform that I have not really truly tried to use to speak out and be an ally and an activist is my music. Hmm. And I really wanted this time for what I did to really authentically represent me and what I stood for. So I am a woman, I am an ally, I am a cellist. And so I just planted the seed that day and I decided that I was going to not only utilize a newfound confidence in being back in school, in studying with a great teacher to go out and even perform solo music, but I was going to commission composers to write music for me. Hmm. And through playing with Public Quartet and my experience at Purchase, I really started to find my sound. I started to find the way I like to play hmm. and the way to perform that really represents me and not just this extract thought of what I think a cellist is supposed to be like. And so a few of the composers that I commissioned I had worked with and were my friends, and a few of them came, recommended to me. Mm -hmm. And I just made so, phone calls. Sorry to stop you for a yeah. second, but, but did you have in your mind when you began to commission composers, were you thinking, okay, this is a project that I'm doing or were you just like, I want to commission these pieces and see where this goes? I had the big picture in mind kind of from the beginning. Okay. I knew that I wanted to have a solo project where I would perform. And I knew that I wanted to have a activism platform. And I knew that I wanted to create educational opportunities okay. and outreach opportunities. That is a lot, you know. Yeah, so a, a whole I lot. decided to take it step by step. And it wasn't, and actually the process was quite drawn out. I came up with this project a little over two years ago. I started out just by making phone calls to these women, these composers, and 
asking them if they would even feel comfortable with the platform that I was trying to create. Mm -hmm. Because there is this whole thing in classical music that classical musicians feel that they cannot be political or speak out for a cause. Really? Um, because, and, you know, this is this is a personal opinion, but this also comes from experiences that I have had. And I have been told on numerous occasions to tone it down because you never know who you're going to offend. I have been told to not be explicit. I've been called inflammatory. I have been told that if I only feature women, that I am actually worsening the problem of sexism. <laughs> so I just, wow. you know, these things are, uh, this feeling is coming directly from what people have been feeding back to me. And I think in the classical world, because our careers depend a lot on, on donors and big institutions depend a lot on donors. Mm -hmm. And so you're inevitably going to have a wide mix of people who have a wide mix of beliefs. And I felt that we all have had to be, feel like we have to be very careful mm -hmm. um, because you don't want to lose your audience. You don't want to turn people off. Right. You know, you, people are there also to be entertained. You don't want to scare them or make them feel bad. You know, all of these, mm -hmm. these kinds of feelings. And I was like, you know, okay, so maybe in every other area of my life I can – play that game a, a little bit in the beginning I felt like that <laughs> yeah and I was like but with this project I am not going to do that I am not going to cater to anybody's need to feel comfortable or I'm not going to cater to into the ignorance and denial of privilege in America and it's my project and so if nobody comes to the show, nobody wants to support it. The only person that is really being affected is me. I'm not ruining anybody else's musical career. Mm -hmm. But honestly, like, it just, the only thing that I have felt from doing that is empowered and supported, actually, from all walks of life within my community. That's that's awesome. So, yeah, I but mean, you it's... You just decided to, to follow that and just kind of go with your gut and then it... And then yeah. it kind of worked out, which I think is when often you, the case, you know? When, yeah, totally. When everybody's telling you, no, 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 you can't you can't do that. And you're like, no, nah, I'm going to do it anyway. It's amazing to see yeah. who comes along with you. On, exactly. On yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you really, I always love that quote, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you really speak your truth and you are very authentic to who you are and your mission, then like you said, the right people will come on board. Mm -hmm. And also people who might not be on board will begin to trust that maybe what you're saying should be taken into consideration and feel empowered themselves to change their thought process, to educate themselves, to grow, and also to have the courage to speak out against injustice. Yeah, that's really awesome. Hey, everybody. Sorry to interrupt your listening to me to get you to listen to me again. Uh, I just wanted to take a break to tell you about this thing that NPR is doing this month called Tripod. It's all about raising awareness about this weird little thing that you're clearly into called podcasting. Do a favor for me. Think about somebody that you care about. Now think about what podcast you think that they would really dig. You got it? Okay. Now go tell them about it. Tell them in real life, tell them on social media, whatever. And if they don't know how to listen to podcasts, show them how. And then uh, tell us what you recommended to this person. We're at CC Shows on Twitter. Use the hashtag tripod. That's T-R-Y-P-O-D. Get it? Oh, and by the way, Mom, if you're listening, I think you should check out the Music That Matters podcast from KEXP. It's got all of this great new music that's curated by the awesome DJs at KEXP, and you can take it on your run with you. So anyway, okay, back to my chat with Amanda.
So let's focus now on the music of the Forward Music Project. So you commissioned these pieces by female composers, and then you're performing them. Can you talk us through some of the music that you have included in the project? Absolutely. There is a piece by Jessica Meyer called Swerve that is all about female empowerment Mm -hmm. and the feeling when everything in your life is going just so, you know, like Mm -hmm. your period's over and (laughs) you've managed to get your coffee in on time and you feel good about yourself and you walk out of the house and you're feeling confident and Jess says that's the moment when you get your swerve on. (laughs) So that piece is incredibly exciting. And she wrote it with me in mind because she's come to see a lot of public quartet shows and we improvise a lot. And I end up, I hit my cello a lot, like drumming and we play crazy sounds and we go, we really just go wild. And so she wrote this piece with that in mind. And I feel like it is truly a piece for me and I love playing it. Okay, let's hear it. So is the, are these sounds all coming from the cello? Yes. So I forgot to mention the most important part, which is that she wrote this piece for loop pedal. Oh, So cool. essentially yeah. I am playing four bars and recording it on a loop pedal and playing another four bars that gets recorded. And so eventually you have many, many layers of cello. I dig it. (laughs) And that's just the beginning part. There's so much more that's really wonderful. But Wow. I really like that sound. That was so cool. I really like how that clip, like, ended. And I'm going to have to go back and listen to the rest of it sometime. Um, So what else do you have? So the next track is by another dear friend of mine, uh, Layla Adu. And she wrote a piece titled For Edna. And For Edna was dedicated to her friend, Edna. Mm -hmm. And it is an homage to the strength of women and the strength of women to overcome domestic violence and the strength of, for Edna in particular, of being a woman of color in America. Mm -hmm. And for the empowerment and the strength that it takes for women to get up every day and face uh, what comes at them. And Edna is a woman who continues to fight and gets up and maintains a positive outlook on life and continues to go forth and fight for the rights of others. Mm -hmm. And she really inspired Layla, and I've met Edna, and Edna, too, inspires me. Mm -hmm. So Layla wrote this piece for solo cello and voice, and um, this recording is the first time I performed it, so um, it was pretty new to me, and um, it was at the Princeton University Sound Kitchen concert. Uh, So you'll hear me sing a little bit, and you'll hear me improvise a little bit. Cool.
I love how stark the mm-hmm. music is, but what you're saying is you're not alone. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She created a lot of resonance and utilized the cello mm-hmm. really nicely with the harmony and the natural ringingness that comes out of such a bassy instrument. Yeah. sound like I'm playing favorites, but the cello is pretty much my favorite. It's the best, you can say it. (laughs) Yeah, okay, it is. It's kind of the best. (laughs) (laughs) Well, before you take us out on the last piece that we're going to hear, I I, want to know, you. I know that this project, the Forward Music Project, where you've commissioned these seven female composers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that this is that it's not it doesn't just end at the music that this is also tied to charitable organizations and things like that. Can you talk about how this um, takes a step beyond even even the music? Yes. So this project is a giving project. It's also a getting project because I enjoy performing and I enjoy making connections and you know this is essentially at the end of the day I, I'm a cellist and I want to perform these pieces mm-hmm. but the project is is really meant to raise awareness of women's issues mm-hmm. and there are going to be a lot of projections and actually voice recordings from the composers and I'm not going to be interjecting much at all except mm-hmm. musically but Usually when I perform, I talk directly to the audience about what the piece was influenced by. And I talk about reproductive rights in concert. I talk about sexual assault in concert. I talk about race and privilege in concert. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't feel right to have all of this information and not try to actually give to organizations that are doing exceptional work around the world for women and girls. And so part of me is going to do that through education and and working with women and teenagers in, in workshops on empowerment. But the other easiest way that I could do this was to just donate all of my artist fees that I receive to what? programs... For those of us out yes. there who don't know what artist fees are, can you oh, talk right. about that? Uh, an artist fee is the the cut that you get from the venue so oh, um, okay. or the okay. payment that you get. So if a presenter is presenting a concert, your artist fee would be what they pay you. If you're oh. playing at a venue where there's a door split, then it's whatever percentage you get from the venue. So the, and this um, is what you're donating to these these organizations. Yes. Okay. So the artist fee that I will get from the premiere performance at uh, National Sawdust on March 1st is uh, going to be donated to five organizations in uh, the United States and abroad. And they are in the U.S. They are Planned Parenthood, Girls Inc., mm-hmm. and Black Women's Blueprint, mm-hmm. and abroad Art and Abolition. And Basma and Zaytuna. And Art and Abolition uh, offers arts therapy and is a offers shelter and is a safe haven for uh, girls who are victims of sexual violence in Kenya. And Basma and Zaytuna are located in Lebanon and Turkey, and they are serving Syrian refugees, but they have a particular emphasis in creating empowerment for women. And in the U.S. Planned Parenthood, we all know. Planned Parenthood. And Girls Inc. has really great programs across the country Mm -hmm. in underserved communities, again, to create empowerment, to help them on the college track, to teach them about financial independence, and also approach LGBTQ issues and race issues and sex education. Wow. 
And Black Women's Blueprint is another amazing organization. They're based in Brooklyn, and they raise awareness on race, but they offer empowerment for women of color and also focus a lot on women of color who uh, have suffered from domestic violence and sexual violence. Wow. That's that's a whole lot of ground that you're covering there. It is. And, you know, like, honestly, I started with two, and then I uh-huh. added three, and I added four, and I added five. It's and hard to choose, I, I'm sure. It's really hard to choose. And, yeah. of course, I can't choose all of them because then each of them would get, you know, like a penny. Right. But it's it's just a small part out of a very large yeah. pool out there of people doing amazing, amazing work. Well, we are coming to the end of our time, so I'd love it if you could take us out on one more piece, maybe just set the set the scene for us. Mm-hmm. The next piece is written by Morgan Krauss, and it is titled Memories Lie Dormant. They are reviled before they are revealed. And this piece I hold very close to my heart because I am honored to be playing it. Morgan uh, chose to open up a personal platform on her experiences of sexual assault and went through that whole painful process of deciding if you want to share your story with the world or not and wants to use this platform as a way for other women who are victims of sexual violence to know that they are not alone and that to offer them offer them empowerment to speak out and not be silent mm-hmm. and of course that it is not their fault mm-hmm. and i'm very passionate about this piece because there is really no justice for victims of sexual violence and it's a real it's a real problem with the shame and victimization that comes along with it. So this piece is very amazing because it's very improvisational. It's it's based on cells, which are the composer will write a box and then have some musical notation or directions within that box. Mm -hmm. And you get to play that box as many times as you want or as many times are directed. So there's a lot of freedom in the piece, but her voice comes through very strong. So I have decisions to make, but they're all sounds that she wants me to do. And the piece is extremely visceral. This is only a short snippet of it, but I I have to I breathe, I hiss, I shout, I shake, and it's it entraps me. So as a performer, it's extremely tiring to play it all the way through. It's very mm-hmm. physical and it's very tiring for the audience to listen to. And that is exactly the point, because when you are a victim of sexual assault, not only in the act are you completely trapped against your will, but you remain trapped for the rest of your life in your mind in dealing with this trauma. <laughs> So what are you doing with the cello here? So with the cello, I am hitting the fingerboard where the strings are. I'm Uh slapping it. I'm breathing in and out and hissing. And I'm playing extremely aggressively. So Mm -hmm. there are little chunks of um, musical notation that I'm playing over and over again, like digging into the cello really, really... Um, aggressively, yeah. And there are parts that are like the cello moans and Uh cries.
This is a very appropriately rough piece to hear. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, there's just no denying <laughs> the feeling that you get from performing and listening to it. was really something, Amanda. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to tell your story and to talk about the Forward Music Project. Speaking of that, I know you've got a lot of performances coming up. And listeners, if you're interested, you can find out more about those at amandagookin.com. Amanda, thanks again for being on The Classical Classroom. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. All right, everyone, that does it for this episode of Classical Classroom. For more Classroom, go to houstonpublicmedia.org slash classroom where you will find all of our episodes and all of our social media links conveniently gathered in one spot. Email me at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. Be a classical music activist by subscribing to, rating, and reviewing us on iTunes. Thanks today to audio producer Todd Take 5 Holsander for making us sound nice. Thanks to Mark DeClaudio for his assistance and his piercing kind of blue eyes. Thanks to Amanda Gukin for her generosity with both her story and her time. Thanks to me for saying words, but most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time.